Hello, everyone, and welcome to Alpine Security Cybersecurity Webinar covering the top five cybersecurity misconceptions. I'm Jana White. I'll be your moderator this afternoon. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Alpine Security. And Christian Espinosa, who is our CEO and founder, will be the presenter of the webinar today. A couple of quick uh, housekeeping tips. There is a Q&A uh, down at the very bottom bar across the, the bottom of your webinar that you've joined. You can enter any questions there and throughout the course of the webinar, we'll go ahead and ask those questions for you and get those answered. I can see all your questions, so your questions won't be lost. Christian will pause periodically during the presentation and we'll ask the questions at those points in time. We're not going to save all of the questions for the end. We also are recording this webinar, so you will receive a link uh, through email to the webinar itself, and it's also going to be up on our YouTube channel. So without further ado, I will turn the webinar over to Christian and let him get started. All right, thanks, Jana. Good afternoon. So today we're, we're gonna be talking about the top five cybersecurity misconceptions. As Jana mentioned, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to throw them into the Q&A channel rather than wait to the end. Uh, I prefer to have questions throughout rather than at the end, like I mentioned. So this is what we'll cover. Uh, we'll go over some facts and context. So why, you know, kind of why we have the situation we have today. We'll talk about these five misconceptions, uh, cloud solutions and problems, threats to small businesses, next-gen firewalls, uh, what the value of data is from an attacker perspective and how egos get in the way. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So a little bit of background about Alpine Security, we're a service disabled veteran owned small business. And we focus on the areas here. A lot of the knowledge and examples from this presentation, this webinar, come from our experience with incident response and penetration testing. We are based in the greater St. Louis area, and there's our web site URL down there. So for some facts and context, so here's some quick facts, and this is from the 2018 Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. Uh, there's, there's this misconception that still today a lot of attacks come from insiders, but the facts show otherwise that 73%, almost three quarters of attacks come from the outside. Uh, and a lot of people think the attacks originate from the inside because the attackers uh, will do things like phishing campaigns to infect an internal user system, which then it makes it appear like the attack came from the inside, but it's actually launched from the outside. 50% of attacks are by organized crime. So basically the organized crime syndicates that used to do traditional crime have now migrated to cyber crime. 58% of victims are small businesses. The attackers aren't, aren't just going after enterprise level organizations, they're also going after small businesses. And a couple of facts that we, we, we've made some improvements on, but we haven't got that great, are the time to detect and the time to compromise. So typically from the time an attacker launches an attack, they can compromise your network measured in minutes. But where we've been deficient on defending against uh, these attacks is the time to detect or even notice the attack. This is usually in, measured in the hundreds of days. So an attacker takes a few minutes to compromise you, but most organizations don't notice this for hundreds of days. And even in some department, department of defense organizations has been up to like six years that the adversary has been on their network before they even noticed. The motivators are money and espionage. Uh, money is always a motivator of a crime, it seems like. And espionage on the right side over there, the picture we have the F-22 as an example and the FC-31, which is a Chinese jet that looks very similar to the F-22. So from an espionage perspective or intellectual property theft perspective, uh, different countries and different companies will steal secrets so they don't have to invest the money in the research to uh, research that technology. As the example I have on the screen there with the F-22, let's say the United States spent 
billions of dollars researching how to produce that aircraft and what kind of materials to use, but the Chinese government can spend a million dollars in a campaign to steal all the intellectual property. Now they don't have to invest the billion to produce that same sort of aircraft. And this happens with uh, other industries as well um, as defense, such as manufacturing. Also with attacks, uh, as the last bullet says, there are nearly 50% of attacks or breaches involve some sort, of, some sort of social engineering component. So from a context perspective, a lot of people ask us like, why would an attacker steal PHI or protected health information? Uh, a couple of reasons, one of them is a shelf life with PHI. For, for instance, with a credit card, if you steal a credit card, the shelf life isn't very much because once the credit card number is, is reported as compromised, you might be able, be able to get one use out of it. But with protected health information, uh, there is no way to revoke or just uh, expire the information. It's, it's pretty much valid forever from a shelf life perspective. And this information can be used for insurance fraud, for identity theft, and a whole slew of things. So on the black market, PHI typically goes between $50 to $400 per record. But the cost to a healthcare provider from the perspective of cleaning up the incident, legal fees, and uh, identity protection costs for people that have their records stolen is typically two to $400 per record. As an example, if an attacker breached 10,000 records, which is not that many, uh, they could make at the lowest dollar amount per record, uh, $500,000. And it would cost at the lowest dollar amount for the healthcare provider around $2 million. So it's very lucrative for an attacker and very costly for a healthcare provider. Uh, this, this, this tactic would be if I were a non-ethical or black hat hacker if I, or if I wanted to retire, uh, very quickly. I would probably use this tactic, cyber blackmail. Uh, this is my favorite tactic. Uh, and I think it's a brilliant tactic to make money. I'm not, I'm not endorsing it by, by no means, but uh, basically what you do, if you're the attacker, you find a list of compromised usernames and passwords on the dark web or on GitHub or Pastebin or somewhere where somebody has dumped this list of usernames and passwords. And this list of usernames and passwords could be from a previous breach. Let's say like LinkedIn was compromised. So typically the username is someone's email address. And if we get that list of compromised usernames and passwords, we can then email those people with their compromised password and try to blackmail them into giving us some information. Uh, so sorry, some money. So as an example here, if we send 100,000 um, blackmail emails and we, we demand $500 or else, let's say, and we have a fall rate of 1%, that's a pretty low number, that's 1,000 people that fall for this cyber blackmail scam. If they all pay, that's $500,000. And that's very easy to make that amount of money because you know, we're looking at a 1% rate there. If we make the money lower, the payment of like $50, the fall rate may increase to 5% because some people would rather pay, pay some money because they think that maybe they have a skeleton in their closet than the or else um, sort of thing. As an example here, this next slide, we have an example. This is a actual cyber blackmail email and you've, some of you may have received one of these. But what, what's happened here is this person on the from up here, Everett Pincus, this is, this is the attacker basically, or someone that's involved with a scam. They, they found that compromised list of usernames and passwords. They sent, they templatized an email and then sent this email to everyone on that list of usernames, which are the email addresses, and they filled in the real password. So what happens is you, is you receive this email and it's got the real password in there, your real password sent to you. And it causes people to freak out a little bit because their real password is used there. And the likelihood is most people use the same password on multiple systems. So when you see an email like this, that basically says they've compromised 
your computer, they know your password, they've you know, got the video on, of your computer on, recording you doing you know, inappropriate things, they have all your contacts, they're gonna send a video of you doing these inappropriate things to all of your contacts, et cetera, unless you pay this money. Most people um, will kind of freak out about this because the real password is in there and a lot of people will actually pay the money just to make sure like, you know, if in the past they did something shady that it's not gonna be released to everybody. And in this case, the money here was $2,900, which is pretty steep. So the percentage fall rate on this one might be a little bit less. So what you can do if you receive an email like this is you can go to this website here, have I been pwned? Dot com. I don't like that word pwned, but you know, it is what it is. I guess some hacker back in the day mistyped owned because uh, the O is next to the P. Uh, but you can go to this site, put in your email address, and when you put in your email address there, it will tell you all the previous breaches or at least all the previous breaches that your email address has been associated with. In this case, uh, that's my email address there. At the very bottom, it shows me um, I, was, I was associated with a breach. My email address was with, through Apollo, but at the very bottom, I don't know if you can see my mouse, at the very bottom of the screen, it shows you what data was compromised um, you, from that account or that breach. So. For my account through the Apollo breach, they got my email address, my employers, geographic locations, et cetera, but my password was not compromised. And this is just another reason to make sure you use a different password in all of your systems in a password manager. So we kind of provide a little, a little bit of background here. So the five misconceptions, before I go into this, does anybody have any questions? Christian, we talked about cyber blackmail, but another big question on a lot of people's minds is, is ransomware attacks if they get hit. So what are the indicators up there in the header that they could look at for credible ransomware attacks or, or ways to prevent phishing that might lead to those kind of attacks? So what would be the indicators in the email, for instance? Yes, correct. Uh, well, typically with ransomware, somebody has already compromised your system unless it's a phishing email and the phishing email is the ploy to compromise your system. So if you receive an email that asks you to click on a link and the link is a bogus link, the link might take you to a website which infects your computer with ransomware or if the email has an attachment like a PDF attachment and it's from someone you don't recognize, uh, if you open that PDF attachment, there could be something malicious in that PDF that installs ransomware on your computer. So that would be like the infection. The next step would be after they've confirmed they've infected you and encrypted your data with ransomware, the next step would be an email where they would ask for a payment uh, in order to give you the decryption key and decrypt the ransomware. Or your screen would be locked and, and give you instructions on how to, how to um, get get back access to your, your system. Did I answer your question? Yep, thank you. Cool, all right. So let's move on here to the five uh, misconceptions. And these, these misconceptions are, from our experience dealing with a lot of uh, clients and a lot of instant response, a lot of penetration tests, uh, these are things that we've witnessed quite a bit, and that's why they're the five misconceptions. The, the, the slide here, I want to just throw this up here because the, the solution to almost all five of these misconceptions is typically training. But one of the things we hear quite a bit uh, from organizations is like a resistance to training is, you know, what if I train my people and they leave, right? Uh, which is kind of a weird mindset to me because uh, as, as shown in red there, like what if they stay? Do you really want a lot of people uh, untrained defending your network, right? I think it's kind of a backwards mindset to think, I don't wanna train my people because they might leave. Uh, so that's the common 
complaint we hear about training people. But most of these misconceptions, as I mentioned, can be fixed with training. So one of the misconceptions is the cloud will fix it. We hear this quite a bit. We have a lot of clients that are migrating to the cloud. And this is uh, kind of how the questions and answers go. Typically, if we're talking to a client and they, they'll say, we've migrated to the cloud and it's a HIPAA secure cloud. And we'll ask a couple questions like, what makes the cloud environment secure? And the answer will be something like, we're not sure, but it's HIPAA compliant. And then we'll ask a couple follow-up questions here, like who controls the systems, firewalls, access, et cetera, on the cloud? Uh, the client or the prospect will say, we do. And then we'll, we'll ask, well, do you have somebody on staff that is cloud certified? Like if you're migrating to AWS, do you have someone that knows AWS, Google, Azure, whatever? And the answer is uh, often no, but the person knows what they're doing, plus the cloud is HIPAA secure. So they go, they go back to that. And this, this we, I just talked to someone today that it's migrating to the cloud and they, there's an assumption that's gonna make them more secure, but the evidence shows otherwise. Uh, this is just an example here recently of Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, they migrated to the cloud. They thought the cloud was more secure. But as we see there highlighted is 60,000 files. We're on an AWS S3 bucket, publicly accessible, which means everyone can get to it, right? And those files had 28 gig of data that included credentials, passwords to US government systems, um, unencrypted passwords, government contractors that held top secret clearances, et cetera. So the cloud isn't, isn't the solution all the time. It doesn't make things much more secure. Here's another example. This is with the Republican National Committee. Again, it's with the AWS S3 bucket. Uh, in this case, there was a flaw in the bucket, and this exposed the personal details of more than 198 million American voters. Uh, and again, they thought the cloud's secure, let's migrate up there, but obviously uh, it's not that secure. It's only as secure as you make it, really. Uh, this is an example that we responded to an incident. We had a a client that migrated to the cloud because they wanted to be more secure. But when they did the migration, they had a few struggles during the migration. So to do some testing and validation, they opened a rule on the cloud that allowed everybody access to their systems on the cloud for the troubleshooting. But what happened is they left that rule there, an attacker was able to compromise all of their systems because their domain controller, their Windows systems were publicly exposed to the internet, like port 445 was publicly exposed and the attacker was able to compromise all of their systems. And we responded to this incident, but the same, the same issue arise, the same issue exists as if you had these systems on your local network, you have to have someone trained that knows what what they're doing they, and somebody when you migrate to the cloud almost has to know more about what they're doing because there's a lot of different nuances of the cloud migration in this case this is just a sample rule set of a firewall and at first glance this rule set might look okay but these are the inbound rules but the default rule which is here after number three shows allow any 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 basically so any protocol, any source, any source port, any destination, any des destination port, that's right there allowing everything. And this is basically what happened with that uh, company that migrated to the cloud is they had a rule that allowed everything. And realistically, you should only allow what's required for your network and block everything else. Um, in this case, this, this rule is backwards, this set of rules that uh, it blocks one thing, which is port 25, but allows everything else. You should do explicit allow and implicit deny on a firewall. 
Uh, the other misconception we hear quite a bit is that companies will say we're a small business, so we're not really a target. You know, why would the attackers want to go after us when they sh could go after somebody like Booz Allen Hamilton or Boeing or Lockheed Martin or some large company? The reality is, though, the attackers will go after the easiest way in and they're running their organizations like a business. So from a return on investment perspective, if they can spend five minutes going after a small target and getting a lot of money out of that versus a larger target, which they may need to spend five weeks uh, to get the same amount of money, they may go after the small target, which is what's happening. On the right side of the slide there, you can see some stats that show 47% of small businesses had at least one cyber attack in the past year, and this is from last year. And 44% of those small businesses had two to four attacks. So the argument that we're a small business and we're not a target is, no, is not really valid. The, this stat is from the Ponymon Institute uh, from last year that said nearly 70% of small to medium businesses experience cyber attacks. So again, it's not just large organizations. If you're a small organization, the reality is your security posture is probably less mature than a large organization, which also makes you more attractive to attackers. One of the other rule or um, misconceptions we hear quite a bit are people say we have a next gen firewall or NG firewall, right? And the questions we typically ask is like, who administers the firewall? And the answer we often get is the sysadmin. Uh, and the question would be, well, you know, does your sysadmin have any cybersecurity experience, certifications, et cetera? Because there's a big difference in my mind from managing a Windows domain controller to managing a next-gen firewall. Uh, technology is not the same across, you know, every platform. But the answer we will get for something like this is no, but he's got five years experience with sysadmin. And then we'll say, well, did your sysadmin attend vendor training on the firewall? The answer we typically get is no. And one of the things you should consider, if you're gonna buy a next-gen firewall, depending on the vendor, a lot of time you can negotiate training for that firewall into the purchase of the firewall because the vendor wants you to know how to use their firewall. So you might as well try to negotiate the training, training as part of the purchase. And then another question we may ask is, uh, have you had the firewall tested? Uh, and like with a penetration test, for example. And the answer we often get is no, but we haven't been breached, so it must be working. But the reality is, as we talked about earlier on one of the previous slides, uh, it takes organizations on average hundreds of days to detect a breach. So the, the lack of something that is hard to detect doesn't indicate success, uh, successful implementation of a next-gen firewall, for instance. Before we go on to number uh, four, or the next part here, does anybody have any questions? So Christian, when we're talking about a next-gen firewall, if we um, want to add a little bit more to that and we use a unified threat management or a UTM device, what are the things we should be worried about with that the same way we think of using a next-gen firewall without having it properly configured? Good question. So if we've got a just to be to make sure I understand your question, you're saying so if you're saying if we have a UTM device, unified threat management device, like what are some of the concerns with that versus the next gen firewall? Yeah, can you define what a UTM is and how that compares to a next gen firewall and how neither one is sort of a silver bullet? Yeah. So a next gen firewall is a firewall that has supposedly some technology that can proactively, um, based on traffic patterns and things, uh, block, block threats to your uh, network. 
Uh, and so, uh, the problem with next gen firewalls is a lot of them are easily circumventable and they're complex to configure. With unified threat management, that's typically a device where you have, you could have a next gen firewall as part of it. You could have an intrusion detection system as part of it. And you could have like your VPN concentrator as part of it. But basically you've got one, one appliance that has multiple functions in it. So just by the nature of what I said there, you're sort of putting all your eggs in one basket. And it's often better to do a defense in depth posture where you have an IDS from one vendor and a firewall from a different vendor or even two different firewalls from two different vendors. Um, but depending on the size of your organization, you would need obviously more expertise to manage two different firewalls versus one vendor's firewall. So a UTM, um, a lot of people like to think that's a silver bullet, like a next gen firewall, but as the next slide here, I'll go to the next one shows, this is the same with the UTM, is most of the breaches are not because of the technology, not a UTM or next gen firewall, it's because of misconfigurations just because you buy an expensive appliance, a next-gen firewall or UTM, doesn't mean it's gonna solve your problems. You have to have someone that knows how to administer that device. And those devices are typically pretty complex. And as I mentioned earlier, what often happens is someone tries to take, an organization will appoint their network engineer or their Active Directory domain administrator and make them the UTM or the next gen firewall administrator without any training. And then we end up with these kind of issues. So essentially it creates a single point of failure because of the misconfiguration. Correct. Yep. Gotcha. And then we talked about cloud a little bit. Could you talk about uh, things to look out for, to watch out for when a company is moving to a cloud solution, the organization's upper management has decided they have to go that way. What are some common things that organizations can watch out for that can be pitfalls when dealing with cloud providers? I think before the decision is made to go to a cloud provider, someone needs to assess the risk of what they're trying to accomplish. You know, what risk are we trying to mitigate? Um, because the risk is basically just transferred. So when you go to a cloud provider, one of the things that organizations need to look out for is w where the responsibility of the cloud provider lies versus where the responsibility of the organization that migrates to the cloud, what, what they're responsible for. A lot of people have this, this assumption that if I migrate to a cloud, like um, let's say AWS, Amazon, that Amazon is gonna control your security. Amazon has security features enabled on their cloud, but you have to administer and configure those features. So that's one thing is kind of who's responsible for what, because you know you have different types of cloud, software as a service, platform as a, platform as a service or infrastructure. So who, who manages what? And then the, another concern is if the cloud is knocked offline, we've had, we've had incidents we've looked at with this, where the cloud provider has been knocked offline and, you, and the company can't get access to their data, what is the mechanism to get that data back? You know, can you call the cloud provider and have them send you a hard drive, for instance, if the cloud provider is completely offline? Um, that's something else to consider. And with the larger cloud providers, you should look at where your data is gonna be stored. Uh, one of the challenges when you pick like Google Azure or Amazon is you have to be very specific about where the data is stored because as example, if you pick Amazon, Amazon may have a data center in Virginia, but they also may have one in India, for example. If your data is not technically allowed to be outside of the United States, then you probably don't want to have your data replicated to a, another cloud provider or to Amazon's provider in India. So those are some things you need to consider when you're migrating to the cloud. And there's a whole, I mean, we could talk about cloud migrations for a long time, but those are some of the high level things along with the uh, service level agreement, which discusses the roles and responsibilities. Okay, thank you. Sure. 
Good question. You're asking some people are asking some tough questions. <laughs> um, so, so the 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 incident we mentioned with the cloud compromise earlier, uh, that same incident was because of the the firewall wasn't configured. So I'm not going to go through that one again, but you know the training would have solved both those issues. Another common misconception we hear is that a lot of organizations don't think they have something valuable to steal, that they don't have any data that's, that they feel is worth stealing. And we deal with this quite a bit. And we, we deal with a lot of defense contracting organizations that actually have data that they don't feel is valuable, but it could be valuable depending on the attacker. So here's, here's a scenario that we encounter. We have an organization that says, we're not a target, you know, we're a small, small organization. We don't really have anything worth stealing. So we'll ask a couple questions like, you know, what does your business do? The answer may be we make custom screws for lightweight materials such as carbon fiber. And then we, could, we ask another question like, who is one of your largest clients? They may say the U.S. Air Force. And then we ask a third question that says, well, how do you know the quantity and types of screws to make? Well, the answer is they provide the specifications. So if you think of this from an attacker perspective, if you have the specifications for, let's say it's a stealth fighter or some sort of um, technology that somebody wants to steal the data uh, and the specifications for, then if you have that because you need it in order to figure out how to manufacture screws, uh, then you are a target. And this has been a large problem so much so that the government, the, Depart the US Department of Defense has come up with a rule that says if you're a contractor and you have controlled unclassified information, which could be like those specifications required for a manufacturer, then you have to have certain standards in place and controls in place to protect that information. And that is called DFARS or NIST you know, references NIST 800-171 uh, as well. So just because you're a small, small manufacturer that manufactures screws or something for a larger program doesn't mean you're immune to attack. The other misconception we hear quite a bit is a lot of organizations will say, you know, we have it covered. Our CISO is a technical genius. We, we don't need any help. We've got, we're all good to go. Uh, you know, our CISO has a master's degree in cybersecurity, which, you know, is good, but it doesn't mean you actually know stuff. That they have a great team. They haven't been breached. They patch their systems. They've got a next-gen firewall and a UTM. So our, our next question might be like, well, it sounds like you're pretty mature. Have you had a penetration test performed? or do you perform threat hunting? And the answer we often get is something like, no, as I told you, we have it covered, sort of the head, head in the sand mindset. But if you feel like you have it covered, as Reagan said here, you know, it's, it's good to trust but verify. You wanna certainly trust your people, know what they're doing, and that they have their patch management is working, your instant response is working, you actually haven't been breached, et cetera, but you should verify that that is, that is indeed the case. A couple uh, other observations that we've made over the years uh, with CISO specifically, since we're talking about, uh, you know, our CISO is a technical genius uh, that's often what we hear is that the CISO is very technical. They know what they're doing. But some of the challenges we've encountered are CISOs that really shouldn't be CISOs. And a lot of organizations think a CISO should be someone that's very technical. But, and I'll go to a slide here later that kind of explains this. But realistically, the CISO's job is not to, to be the technical expert. It's to be somebody that can interface between the technical people and management or the board of directors, for instance. And often what we have is something like this, which just exacerbates the problem is we've got 
a CISO that may have been a software developer, network engineer that sort of has a mindset that I'm technically smarter than everybody. And if people can't speak my language, then they're stupid. <laughs> so you have a CISO explaining something to the board of directors or to the CEO, but the CEO and the board of directors don't really understand it because they don't speak technical or robot talk, as some people like to say. So it's, it's important to help solve some of these challenges that the CISO or whoever's in that position have the appropriate skills, which are typically not technical skills. Uh, as an example here, these are the top 10 CISO skills. Uh, this is from Gov Info Security. And if you look at these skills, and this is a, from a research, a researchers that surveyed 18 state CISOs. If you look at these skills, none of them are technical, um, but we end up with CISOs that focus on technical skills. And, and that's, that's one of the, the problems, as I mentioned. So the skills here, you know, communication, presentation skills, policy development, political skills, supervisory skills, uh, et cetera. As I mentioned, none of these are technical skills. And from our experience, a lot of people just promote a software developer, network engineer into the position of CISO and expect them to figure out how to do all these things. But they focused on the technical stuff versus the business items. Does anybody have any questions? Is, are there any training programs or certification programs for CISOs that would give a company some idea that the person actually understood what that position entailed and would be a good fit for their, their organization? Yes, there is. The, uh, there is one program that I'm, I'm aware of called the Certified CISO. Uh, certified CISO certification and course that is um, put on through EC Council. We we teach that course and we offer that course a couple times a year. But that course, kind of like the slide sh shows, doesn't really focus on anything technical. It focuses on if I'm a CISO, you know, what are the things I should be concerned about from a from a high level perspective? Like, how do I, if we do have an incident or a breach? Uh, which most organizations will have at some point. How do you properly respond to that? You know, what do you tell the media? What do you tell your vendors? How do you manage that? How do you keep critical things running while you're sort of fighting or tracking down or containing the incident? It goes through a lot of that versus, you know, you need to like understand uh, in different encryption types, for instance. Uh, and that, that, that's a, a relatively new certification. They're on version three of it. It just came out a couple years ago and it's received quite a bit of traction in the industry. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, so we, we haven't had a lot of questions here, but these are the things we talked about. If anyone has any other questions, I'll be happy to entertain them. Uh, we talked about these five misconceptions here, the cloud, and how the cloud can actually cause problems. And as we discussed, when you migrate to the cloud, you need to have someone that understands how to administer and administrate the things that you have in the cloud. Uh, just because you migrate to a HIPAA secure cloud doesn't mean your environment is HIPAA secure or secure from threats. You have to have someone that knows how to administer the firewall and everything in the cloud. We talked about threats to small businesses. A lot of small businesses think they're immune to attacks. We kind of went over how that's not the case. Uh, we went over next-gen firewall issues as well. And UTM, that was brought up as well, that just because you have a next-gen firewall or UTM, you still have to have somebody on staff that is trained and knows how to administer those devices. We went over the, a little bit of the value of data from an attacker perspective, specifically the value of data from... Um, controlled unclassified information. So if you're a defense contractor and you have specifications that you don't think are that valuable because you only produce screws, an example, 
the attacker may want to steal the specification from you and someone else so they can piece it together and build a stealth fighter similar to one of ours. And we talked about a little bit about egos. I didn't go into great detail about it, but with CISOs, a lot of CISOs were promoted from a very technical position and they kind of have that same mindset about that everyone else should speak at their level, a technical level versus adapting to the mindset that in their position as a C-level in the organization, they should really be looking at things more holistically and strategically and from a business impact perspective. So this recording, uh, we recorded this, this uh, webinar. We'll put this on our YouTube channel, which is here uh, at the, on the slide. Uh, any upcoming events we have on our website, an events section there. If we have an, another webinar, uh, we'll put that on there and we'll, we'll, we'll push it out to, to you via social media and via mailing list as well. And there's our contact information. Does anybody have any parting words or final questions here? I don't have any questions currently in the queue, but I'll give it a second to see if anybody might be typing something. All right. You're, you're quite welcome, Karen. Uh, we appreciate all of you attending our webinar today. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. I hope this was uh, insightful and meaningful for everyone. If you do have any other questions about cybersecurity, you can check out our website. Uh, we will be having other webinars and events throughout the year. You can visit our website under the events tab and take a look at that as well. Uh, or you can contact us through our info line at info at alpinesecurity.com and we'd be happy to reach back out to you and answer any questions you might have. Uh, have a wonderful Wednesday afternoon, everybody. And again, thank you for joining us.